Let me welcome Daniel Kurtz Phelan, who is now the executive editor of Foreign Affairs. Not for very long, though. For about six months. Six Seven months. months yeah. Wow. Okay. But we're not going to criticize or praise foreign affairs Good. today. It's we're going to talk fault, yeah. about this new book, uh, The China Mission, which talks about George Marshall's uh, attempt to uh, make peace between the KMT and the CCP in uh, the 45 to 47 period, which, as some of you know from previous programs, especially Richard Bernstein when mm -hmm. we hosted him, that period is very close to my heart because I had written my thesis many, many years ago, before some people in this room were born, maybe even before you were born, the, uh, on the origins of Chinese Communist foreign policy towards the United States, but I focused on the period leading up to the Marshall Mission. So I think this is a wonderful, I was looking for stuff in the book, which I didn't agree with, but it's so well researched and so well written right. that I can't find too much that I don't agree with. But it's, it's really, it's a wonderful kind of account of that period. Um, and it brings it to life. I mean, these characters who we've all read about, some of whom I've met, um, just are, are, you know, they jump off the pages of the book, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful read. Who have you met? Sorry to, to interrupt that, but... Uh, Chiang Kai-shek I've met. Got it, okay. um, uh, I never met Joanne Lai. I never met Mao. Got it, uh, okay. Met Madam Jay. Got it. Um, you know, in the old days, when you were a student in Taiwan, they would... There were not many Americans who studied in Taiwan, and on uh, National Day, they would host the American students in, uh, in, the, in the National okay. uh, Palace, and you would go and, and shake their hands. That's very cool. And have okay. a photo. Uh, but let me turn, Daniel will speak for 20 minutes or so, okay. and then uh, we'll open it to questions. But thank you for, for writing this book. Well, thank it's you so really much. really great fun. Um, thank you so much for having me. Thanks to the National Committee um, for doing this. Uh, I've been, as I was just telling Steve, um, at work on this for five or six years, so it's um, really fun to suddenly be able to talk to people who are not, you know, my wife or my parents about, <laughs> they, 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 got a, they got a little bored at a certain point. So, um, you know, the, the, in, in the broadest outlines, the, the story of Marshall's China mission is the story of one of the, really the greatest military and diplomatic figures, probably in American history, um, certainly in the 20th century, taking on what is really one of the hardest and most consequential problems in, in American <coughs> foreign policy. Um, most people who know of George Marshall think of him either in the World War II context when he was um, the, the senior most army general or as Secretary of State a little later uh, when he became the namesake for the Marshall Plan, there, which, which uh, drove the reconstruction of Europe. But this is about 13 months that comes in between World War II and the Marshall Plan, 1945 to 1947, when he is in China, um, sent, sent on this mission and what I found as I, as I dug into this is that it, it not just shaped Marshall's career and uh, his, his career as a statesman and a secretary of state in really um, powerful and important and surprising ways, but it really also um, in, in fundamental ways shaped the U.S.-China relationship and American foreign policy for decades in, in ways both, uh, both good and bad. Um, and, and that you can kind of see the echoes of this mission uh, even today, you know, so for decade, decades afterwards. Um, the whole arc is fascinating. You know, I spent five years on this because the kind of human texture of, of this story is so amazing. Um, but I'm going to try to focus on um, a few key elements of, of, of the story I tell. Um, I'll try to draw those out and then happy to talk about anything else in the, um, um, the question and answer. But, but first, let me just talk a little bit about who Marshall is. So I think um, certainly in, in, in my generation, uh, he is a, you know, kind of a name from a history book, but people don't have a great sense of the full scope of his career. Um, and, and at the moment when he, when this story begins, uh, in the fall of 1945, just after the end of World War II, uh, Japan surrendered in August 1945, uh, Marshall is really one of the most towering figures on Earth. He has just been U.S. Army Chief of Staff for six years. He took over on September 1st, 1939, uh, the morning that um, uh, German troops went into Poland. He was, he was uh, woken up by a phone call before he was supposed to start his first day of work telling him that, uh, that, that units are at the Polish border. So um, he's been kind of central to this whole experience of World War II. He's really been one of the key um, architects of allied victory over the, the Germans and Japanese. Um, he has this amazing public profile in the United States. He's uh, Time's Man of the Year at a, at a time when that mattered a lot, when Time uh, really did have incredible cultural prominence. Um, 
there's a, a draft marshal movement trying to get him to run for president. Uh, you read quotes from, from Churchill who talks about his, um, his, his gigantic brain. Uh, Truman called him the greatest military leader that, that ever lived. Uh, so he really did have just this um, unrivaled public profile and kind of esteem. And it's really hard to even, uh, you know, people often ask about um, analogies today. And it's really hard to come up with someone in, in public life who has uh, the, the, the kind of profile that, that Marshall had. And you, you know, read, I went back and read uh, letters and diaries and memoirs from really some of the, the most famous figures of that day. And um, they go into these kind of giddy raptures when they're talking about Marshall <laughs> and they're talking about being around him. And um, you know, the, the, the thing that really came through again and again in reading these is they, they talk about the presence that Marshall had and the way that the minute he walked into a room, he spread this sense of authority and calm, and kind of stoic leadership. And that, that was really central, that kind of stoic self-discipline was really central to uh, the public image of Marshall and the image that people um, had at the time. And one thing that was really interesting in, in digging into Marshall's life and um, looking at it a little bit more closely is the extent to which that, that image, the image of the kind of great stoic, um, which we have of him now, but people had, him, uh, had of him at the time as well, uh, really is wrong. It's a, it's a, it's a sto it's an image that that Marshall created, um, concealing what I think is a kind of person who is is much more interesting than the kind of gray historical figure that we know today. Um, there's a, a a line I came across that I love from a an army officer who worked with Marshall during World War II. Uh, Marshall, the officer said, is the greatest actor in the army. <laughs> Everyone thinks Douglas MacArthur is, but the difference with Marshall is you never know he's acting. So Douglas MacArthur, another uh, famous army general, is this theatrical and blustering and narcissistic character. And you know, Marshall is this self-contained, very disciplined stoic. Um, but the, the, uh, the officer who, who, who said that line really was right. Marshall had um, created this image of the stoic. And you see it, if you go back a little bit earlier in his life, in, in his mid-30s, he was rising so slowly through the army. Um, that he thought he had to quit. He thought there was no path, no future for him in the army. Um, it wasn't like he, his career just suddenly rocketed him to the top. He was, he was kind of a mess at the time. He, um, he cursed, he smoked, he had a terrible temper. Uh, he had two nervous breakdowns when he was in his 30s. He was um, collapsed on the street in the Philippines and was, uh, ended up being hospitalized for what they called nervous exhaustion. So um, he, he created this character who could withstand the pressure and that became the marshal that we know in history. And I, there's something kind of analogous uh, in the story of the China mission that they both um, cut against the image of Marshall and the kind of image of that time that I think a lot of Americans have. So we get to kind of three, three kind of key elements of the story uh, which touch on, on di different points in Marshall's mission. Um, you know, the first thing that, that struck me as I went back and thought about this period and the time is um, first of all, how unsettled this moment in history was and how the question of what would happen in China and what, from a U.S. perspective, should be, should be done about China um, really cut to the heart of a series of really um, major challenges in this post-World War II era. So I think when we look back at the history, we kind of think of World War II and the Cold War starting kind of immediately. But there's this really fascinating um, period of months or years, depending on how exactly you date the beginning of the Cold War, um, when people, at least in the United States, really don't quite understand what's going to happen. And uh, the, the challenge of what's going to, the question of what's going to happen in China really is at the center of that. So go back to, to Marshall for a second. You know, he, he uh, has just led, helped lead the victory, the Allied victory in World War II. Um, he's this acclaimed figure, but he's really exhausted after the six years in the army. Uh, he is about to turn 65 years old. His wife, Catherine, has been waiting for him to retire for, for years. She has um, vacations planned for them. He has hunting trips planned. He just wants to go back home to um, his, the house they have in Leesburg, Virginia, just outside of Washington, and garden and hunt and read and start his retirement after, after World War II. And so the day after his retirement ceremony in the courtyard of the Pentagon, which is a new, a new building at the time, uh, he and Catherine drive out to Leesburg, Virginia, and ready to begin their retirement, and they walk through the door of the house, and within, in less than an hour, he, the phone rings, the phone rings in their house, and it's uh, President Truman on the line. And Truman says to Marshall, um, General, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but uh, I've got one last favor to ask you. I know, I know you just retired, but I just need one little, one little last favor. And Ka uh, uh, Catherine, 
hears this, hears that this call has happened and is immediately furious because she knows that her husband is not the kind of man who can say no to this kind of request from the president. Now, for, for Truman, the reason he calls on Marshall is that at a time of a lot of challenges for him, both in the, on the home front and, and globally, um, China represents this really unique challenge. So, and, and it's a challenge that really threatens the whole American vision for the post-war world. So at, at, at the time, we thought of um, the post-war peace being upheld by the four great powers. So it was supposed to be the United States, the United Kingdom, the Soviet Union, and China together keeping the post-war peace. It was the big four, the four policemen. Um, and and that, that was the center of the vision for the post-war that FDR had talked about through the war. And it still did, in key ways, um, guide, guide US foreign policy and guide post-war planning. Um, and, and it was at the center of how we were going to prevent uh, another calamity like the one that uh, the world had just lived through. The problem was that um, one of the four pillars of peace, or multiple problems, but one of the problems was that one of the four, four pillars of peace is China at the time. And China uh, does not really look like the democratic great power that America wanted it to be. It looks a lot more like a failed state in, in, in many ways. Um, the nationalists and Chiang Kai-shek are, are um, uh, in charge of the central government and they're kind of slowly reestablishing control over uh, Chinese territory that had been occupied by Japan. They're in Chongqing at the time and kind of planning to move the capital back uh, to Nanjing where it had been before um, Japanese invasion. Uh, but Mao and the communists are, are challenging for them, them for control and uh, people are, the number of refugees is staggering. There's um, problems with inflation and feeding the population. And so Truman looks at this growing civil war. He looks at uh, growing fears of the kind of Soviet menace globally. The Soviets have troops in Manchuria uh, from, from the last days of World War II. Um, he looks at the, the, the uh, challenge of the Chinese communists and he says, uh, I need someone who can go fix this problem for me. And to him, Marshall is the only one with this kind of stature and profile uh, to go solve what seems like this um, uh, problem that threatens to upset the whole post-war peace. So, uh, you know, he calls on well, the American who'd done as much as anyone to win the war to now go save the peace for him. And that's why um, he, he, he makes this request. And he, you know, kind of wishful thinking on Truman's part, he says, I think it's just going to be, you know, a couple months. Go, go take care of things between Mao, Mao and, and, uh, and the nationalists and, uh, you know, create a Chinese democracy. And then you can come home and start your retirement. And of course, instead of it being a couple months, it ends up being 13 months. Um, and instead of Marshall retiring, this ends up really starting what may be the most interesting and important phase of Marshall's career. He becomes Secretary of State after this. He becomes Secretary of Defense a, a bit later during the, um, uh, the Korean War. And to, to Catherine Marshall's chagrin, it's really, it's six years uh, from this moment before he really retires. Um, so, 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 you know, Truman really wants it to be this quick mission, but it turns out that's not, uh, that's, that's not how it's gonna be. So, you know, a, sec a second thing that really surprised me and that really s stood out as I um, went back through uh, Marshall's records from the time and the accounts of those around him is how swept up he is in, um, in this first part of his mission when it seems like it's working. So, his charge from Truman is to go to China, which is a journey that takes six days by plane at the time um, for a you know, 65 year old man who's just had uh, an unimaginably difficult six years. Um, he's supposed to go, he's supposed to patch things up uh, between the national and communists who have been you know, fighting on and off for 20 years by this point. He's supposed to uh, lay the groundwork for a US allied Chinese democracy and he has to make sure that the, the Soviets don't get, into, get up to anything. Um, uh, problematic. So he, Marshall gets there and he's, he's under no illusions about how easy this will be. This is not a goal that he set for himself, but is the kind of uh, a, a core aim of U.S. foreign policy. So he goes and, and he, he gets to work and he, um, in this very, you know, kind of telling way, for weeks doesn't really say anything. He gets there and people kind of expect this great man to show up and make these pronouncements. There had been an earlier U.S. envoy, uh, you wrote about um, Patrick Hurley, who is this, uh, of amazing, colorful, kind of ridiculous character. Ridiculous would be the um, right word, yeah. He was uh, an Oklahoma oil man who really wanted a kind of important role during the war. So Marshall actually said to FDR, why don't you send him over to China? He'll, get, he'll at least be out of your hair. And he would show up and um, I think famously when he went to meet Mao for the first time, yep. he um, let loose a Choctaw war whoop and all the Chinese communists were just like, right. gets off the plane. Who, who in is Yen, this guy? Gets off yeah. the plane in Yan'an, yeah. and that from the top of the stairs uh, lets out a 
Indian War Whoop. Yeah, and, there, and there's this line from before he goes where he says, um, I, can, I can handle these guys. They're just like Mexicans, and I know how to handle Mexicans, which was uh, pretty telling in terms of how, he, how, he, how Hurley approaches work. So Mar Marshall is kind of the exact opposite. He shows up. He says almost nothing at the beginning. He doesn't really make any public statements. He starts meeting with, uh, with, with Zhang and Sung Mei Ling, Madame, Madame Zhang Kai-shek, and with Joe and Lai, and with uh, kind of lots of different actors on, on all, all sides of this. And he just kind of listens to them um, for, for weeks and weeks. And, and the kind of core challenge, as he sees it, is that there's a, there's a, a sequencing problem. Um, he's trying to get the, the communists to lay down their weapons. He's trying to get the, uh, the nationalists to open up political power a bit. But both sides say, well, I'm not going to give anything up until the other side gives up first. So the nationalists say, we, we can talk about sharing political power once the communists have um, given up their armies. And the communists say, well, there's no way we're going to give up our armies until uh, we have some guarantee that, that we're going to have a, a role in, uh, in, a, in a coalition government. So Marshall's challenge is how you kind of create a choreography that um, can overcome, overcome that logjam. And what's remarkable even to him is that after about a month there, everything seems to be working kind of miraculously. Uh, he gets a ceasefire after, after about a month. Um, he gets a deal. He spends a lot of time sitting with representatives from each side and gets a deal to merge the two armies with you know, agreements about the ratio of you know, former nationalist troops to former communist troops and where they're going to be arrayed. Um, he, he works behind the scenes to um, help lay the groundwork for a new Chinese constitution, which is going to be the kind of blueprint for this new uh, coalition democratizing government. And even Marshall gets really swept up in this moment. So you see him um, kind of uh, bringing this uh, democratic evangelical fervor to his task that he didn't really have at the beginning. But um, after all of this seems to be working, he starts to talk about uh, um, about the kind of uh, the American model and what it, what it means to China. And there are these kind of amazing moments in retrospect where he's reading uh, Benjamin Franklin speeches to you know communist representatives and telling them you know the kind of what they can learn from the American Constitutional Convention. Um, there's a point when he goes to meet with the director Frank Capra, who had. Um, was about to start filming a movie called It's a Wonderful Life, which of course became very famous. Um, at, at this point, Marshall wants Capra <laughs> to make a series of instructional videos for the, for the Chinese people, teaching them how democracy works, um, which is just you know kind of kind of amazing in retrospect. Um, there, there's a moment when he meets with um, with Chiang Kai-shek and hands him a, a blueprint for a Bill of Rights. Marshall actually writes the basis for a new Chinese constitution, and he does it he does it privately, and he says to um, mm to the nationalists, this is a dose of American medicine for you. And, and Marshall thinks they, they find that comment kind of funny. But when you look in, um, in Zhang's diary, he, of course, is uh, uh, totally furious about the comment, which is, which is I think, fa fairly understandable. And so Marshall is swept up in this moment. But you know, so, is, uh, so are all these other people, um, many of whom would later uh, disavow ever having thought this was possible. So you read um, the correspondence from people like Henry Luce, who became uh, a, a real critic of Marshall in this period later, and, and Luce thinks Marshall has done it, and Douglas MacArthur thinks Marshall has done it, um, Stalin thinks Marshall has done it at one point, uh, Mao is sending kind of communiques out to, out to um, his uh, uh, party members telling them that they're going to have to follow the political path now. And there's this moment for a few months in early 1946 where people say Marshall had saved China, and people talk about this kind of mirac miraculous achievements. And at, the kind of high water mark of this moment, Marshall goes on what is sort of a victory tour around China. He goes to all these um, places that had been at war for you know years, if not decades, where you'd had kind of tens of thousands of nationalists and communist troops fighting, and he's this kind of emissary of peace, and he's brokering local arrangements and talking about um, the 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 future of um, this cooperative government and the future of the U.S.-China relationship. And at the um, kind of uh, at the end of this trip around China, he goes to Yan'an and and meets with Mao and spends this kind of incredible 24 hours. Um, he's staying at the Dixie Mission, which was had kind of uh, uh, established during World War II, where there were American diplomats and officers and spies um, in communist, the communist capital. And Marshall sits with Mao, and they talk about uh, you know, what Mao can learn from the United States and the importance of American capital and agriculture and, um, and culture to the future of, of Chinese democracy. Um, and, and it's, it's in a kind of eerie historical coincidence, at that very moment when Marshall's sitting in, in Yan'an talking to Mao about U.S.-Chinese friendship, 
uh, the, the CCP officials are also watching very carefully what's happening in the United States. And that same day, March 5th, 1946, uh, Winston Churchill is touring the US. He's in Fulton, Missouri, giving a speech about the Iron Curtain falling between the Western and communist worlds, which becomes a kind of, you know, one of the key moments in the beginning of the Cold War. And it's, it's around this time that US-Soviet tension is really changing the, the international landscape when people are starting to wonder what, um, whether rather than this cooperative, peaceful future of the big four powers keeping the peace, the defining forces or defining um, conflict in the, in the new world is really gonna be US-Soviet tension. And that changes the way Mao and, and uh, the communists and nationalists think about their, their role. Both of them start to say, you know what, I think we can risk a fight to the death. I think that we're, we're looking at a very different kind of international landscape and that, that changes what we can do. Both of us are gonna be backed by our outside powers. The communists start to say, you know, Stalin was telling us to cooperate before. Now, in, a, in an era of US-Soviet tension, Stalin's gonna back us. Zhang, similarly, is saying, you know, whatever Marshall is telling me now, ultimately, the Americans are gonna have my back in this fight to the death that's gonna be, you know, probably the first battle in World War III. They really do um, think that World War III is coming. And, um, you know, one important and also kind of amazing detail, uh, John kind of has good reason for thinking that the Americans are, are gonna back him. Um, for one thing, he gets this piece of secret information early in Marshall's mission. Right. Marshall had uh, m meets with Truman before he leaves for, for China and has a conversation with Truman about what should be done if the original plan doesn't work. So Marshall's supposed to go tell both sides they have to cooperate or else. And Marshall says, well, what happens if, uh, if the nationalists don't cooperate? What if they're, what if they're not willing to? Um, should I, are we gonna withdraw US support from the nationalists? Are we gonna continue supporting them? And Truman says, and other US officials say, look, like, we'll figure that out when you get there. Don't worry about it. Just like, you'll get it done. And Marshall, because he thinks in, in, in these ways, keeps saying, no, I, I need to know what plan B is. What do I do if, if, if this doesn't work? Um, and so finally Truman says, look, realistically, we're not gonna fully withdraw support from, uh, from the nationalist government. We've, we've backed them for a long time. They're our allies. Um, and so uh, Marshall says, okay, got it. It's supposed to be a private conversation, but it leaks from the, from the White House. And John gets word of this when Marshall's mission is beginning. And, and uh, so John has this information saying, well, Marshall might tell me I have to cooperate, but ultimately I know the Americans are gonna have my back no matter what. And that's reinforced by lots of other messages he's getting um, from the United States in spring 1946 as, uh, as Marshall continues to, to his, his peace mission. And you, know, you, start, you start to see the first, um, uh, first signs of what would be called, become called domino theory um, a bit later when Amer you know, Americans start talking about what happens if one country ch falls to communism. And you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of funny when you look at the original, ver original attempts to work out this theory because they can't quite come up with the right analogy. <laughs> so you'll have, um, you'll have people talking about the great snowball of communism rolling through Asia, taking down you know, China, then Vietnam and India. Um, or, or there's a, a senator or a US congressman who talks about um, communism as a baseball game, strangely, where he says it's gonna get to first base in China and then um, second base in uh, in Japan and third base in Africa, and then it's gonna hit, hit a home run when it comes to the United States. And you kind of want to shake these guys and be like, dominoes, like you're looking, you're looking for the analogy of dominoes. But at any rate, they, um, <laughs> that came later. No, that, that's right, we, we figured that out <laughs> soon. Um, but, but John sees this thinking, he hears it from um, his friends and allies in the United States, and, and both sides say, World War III is coming and this is gonna be the first battle, and so we don't, we don't really need to cooperate. Um, you know, finally, just to, to skip ahead to the end of the, the mission um, and, the, and the kind of consequences going forward, you know, the, the, the third thing that really struck me as I um, spent time uh, with the story and with Marshall is just how much the kind of shadow of Marshall's China mission um, loomed over both his life but also over American politics and foreign policy uh, and, and the U.S.-China relationship for really decades after that. So Marshall comes home in, in January 1947 having failed to uh, achieve what he thought he was gonna achieve, and he immediately becomes Secretary of State. Uh, and goes almost immediately from thinking about just this problem in China, where he's been for 13 months, to thinking about a whole world where there are uh, concerns really all over the place about um, starving populations and collapsing governments and all of that leading to communist success and Soviet takeover. And that, that's really what 
American policymakers start to focus on in, in 1947 when he becomes Secretary of State. And that really, the, his experience in China really shapes um, the way he approaches that global task in, in kind of two key ways. One is when he starts to look at um, Europe, he focuses on the same factors that he'd come to see as really essential when he's in China. So he gives the speech announcing the Marshall Plan in, in June 1947 at Harvard, and he talks about the need for a, a foreign policy that focuses on poverty and hunger and desperation and chaos. And that's what he'd come to see as really essential when he was in China, that the, the, the key factors were not necessarily just military, but about who could um, deliver political order and, and economic success and food and jobs to a population. And so much of what he was trying to do in China and so many of the arguments he's having with, um, with John Kai-shek and other nationalist officials when he's there um, is focused on this question. And it's the same thing that he brings to his vision for Europe. And so you, you can see the kind of the exact same phrases that he's using in China in December 1946 um, applied to Europe a few months later. And so, so much of his vision and that, that kind, of, kind of global vision becomes very central to US foreign policy really through today um, is born out of, uh, out of this experience in China, his first time really serving as a diplomat. But he also um, comes to be very skeptical about the uh, ability of American power to fundamentally reshape domestic um, situations anywhere, and, and especially in China. So there's a, as, as Mao comes closer to victory in um, 47, 48, and 49, there's a, a growing debate in the United States about what, what should be done, how can the US save China? And you see um, proposals to send you know, thousands of advisors to go into <coughs> combat with nationalist troops. You see um, a proposal to put Douglas MacArthur in charge of, of the nationalist armies. Um, there are uh, various plans to um, put American officers in charge of, of, uh, of nationalist divisions. And, and Marshall's a real, a real skeptic um, that that can fundamentally change uh, the balance of forces domestically in China. And that really grows out of his experience trying to do this. Um, uh, on, on the mission, and he looks around the globe and is really, you know, what, what he's not just talking about uh, applying American power and ambition, but being really selective about where it will work and not work. And, and that, that grows out of uh, the challenges over these 13 months. And then, you know, the, the, the last shadow, the, the last piece of this that really looms over um, policy for decades is the who lost China question. So after um, Mao wins, this becomes really one of the central questions in American politics for years. Um, we think about McCarthyism in the 1950s, and there's a, probably the most famous line, the kind of slogan of McCarthy is about a, when he talks about a, a conspiracy so immense and infamy so black. That line, that kind of slogan of McCarthyism comes in a speech denouncing Marshall on the floor of the US Congress. So Marshall, after being this war hero, after being Secretary of State, um, all of a sudden is being denounced as a, as a traitor and as a kind of communist patsy or a closet communist for having, uh, having allowed Mao to win. And it's such a powerful force in American politics that when Marshall's protege, Dwight Eisenhower, runs for president in 1952, um, the, the, the question is so uh, poisonous, it's the, the politics of this are so bad, that Eisenhower goes to campaign with Joseph McCarthy in, in Wisconsin, McCarthy's home state. And rather than standing up for Marshall, the kind of man he looks to as almost a father who kind of made his entire career, Eisenhower instead embraces McCarthy and refuses to, uh, to stand up for his mentor because the um, politics of the Who Lost China debate were so, were so powerful. And, and mm. in the, you know, McCarthy um, flamed out during that period, but you see it in these debates among foreign policymakers for, for decades after that, especially in Vietnam when um, you look at the Kennedy and Johnson administrations and they say, God, like we can't lose another, can't lose another Asian country to communism. And you know, L LBJ has these amazing quotes, um, and I apologize for the language, but it's it's LBJ, so it's hard to avoid. Where he says, you know, look at look at what happened to those guys who lost China. That's going to be chicken shit compared to what happens to us if we lose Vietnam. So as he's, you know, sending combat troops into Vietnam, which he's skeptical, he doesn't think it's going to work. He says, well, we can't we can't lose we can't lose make lose another uh, another Asian country, and even into you know into the the 70s and 80s, you hear um, in debates about intervention this same question of uh, how do we avoid losing in other countries. So um, happy to talk about other more contemporary parallels, but that uh, really is a powerful force in American foreign policy that um, you know extends the story of these 13 months up to the present, really. Mm -hmm. wow, fascinating. The, um, let, let's start with a little more of the history, and then yeah. we'll try to bring it 
up to the, the present. But I think I asked you in our podcast, was he doomed? Was there any, was this mission, there was just no way that it could have worked, didn't matter if you'd sent God himself, it couldn't have been fixed. There was no way that the KMT and the CCP were gonna cooperate. So, um, I mean, I think the counterfactuals and the contingencies are really fascinating here. Um, the, the moment at the beginning of the mission when the Cold War hasn't really fully taken shape, the international circumstances are in some ways favoring an agreement because you know mm -hmm. St Stalin um, is still exploring uh, more cooperative arrangements in certain places and is telling Mao, look, you've got you've to play along with Marshall. The Americans are telling the nationalists that they have to, to be cooperative and, and both sides say, look, this is, we're entering an era of peace so we have to play along. If this, you know, you shifted the, the timing of Marshall's mission a bit and peace had taken hold um, and some of these arrangements had been able to uh, get a little bit more established before uh, international tensions really, um, really escalated. You know, I think there is some chance that mm -hmm. they would have persisted for some time. But what Marshall really discovered is that, you know, to, to answer your question a little more directly, uh, the forces were really beyond him. That it wasn't about, you know, whether he approached negotiation in a slightly different way or um, tried to use leverage on one side or the other, or, you know, threaten threaten Zhang with a, you know arms embargo, that there were these kind of fundamental um, disagreements about the, the, the future, of, future of China and that mm -hmm. that really was an existential fight. And given um, the international circumstances that were fanning those tensions, uh, there, were, there was nothing that, you know, short of a, a really major intervention, which he thought was unlikely to work mm -hmm. and would have created other risks um, uh, that, that the U.S. could do. From, as I read the book, the one, I, I guess I said I basically agreed with everything, but I guess there was one part where I, I think you, you understate the Mao and, and Judah and Joanne Lai's fundamental distrust and dislike of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. They had been screwed by the Soviet Union since the, founda since the formation right. of the Chinese Communist Party. Every two, three mm -hmm. years, they get screwed that they really didn't like and didn't trust these guys, right. which in a lot of ways, and then, and again, I don't think it was Marshall, but Hurley, basically, that the, the, the Chinese Communist Party was actually prepared to cooperate with the United States in a very major way. I think by the time Marshall arrived, less so. Right. But earlier on, because of this fundamental dislike and distrust of the Soviets. I mean, they really right. didn't right. like them. And internal communications right. released subsequently show that right. this is true. And then history proved it absolutely. And I would say if I did, if I if I'd done what Stalin told me to do, I'd be dead now. Yes, that's right. Which yeah. is which is true. So, didn't that really, in a way, push the Chinese Communist Party towards us? And that if we had been more welcoming, more embracing probably earlier than the Marshall Mission, we may have had a very different result in China. So, uh, uh, Not of cooperation, right. but of a Chinese Communist Party that was more pro-American. So I, I think that there was potential for more cooperation during World War II. Um, once, once you get into the post-war period, right. given everything that had happened up to that point and given the extent of the, the disagreements between the nationalists and communists, leaving aside the, the, the global context, um, it would have been very hard to, I think even if you fully abandoned the nationalists and made a kind of fairly definitive turn to the other side, it would have been very, very hard to find some kind of cooperative arrangement that would have um, worked in a Cold War context. I think where th we, made, we made mistakes was then in, in um, being slow to recognize that divergence later. So, and, and, that's, and that's in part a result of the politics of, of, of the aftermath here. when. Yeah. The who lost China question makes it so hard to right. um, talk about the, the uh, Sino-Soviet relationship in sensible ways that um, even even as people start to notice that there is tension, really, you know, long before Nixon goes to China, you know, people in the kind of 50s and 60s, even in the 40s, you know, people would talk about the the coming split. But because um, the politics of it were were as they were. Right. It was very hard for anyone to act on that. So the kind of I, I think the what ifs come in some ways earlier. Or the, the the opportunities yep. for a, a um, more cooper cooperative arrangement come somewhat earlier and come uh, 
in the 50s and 60s, but you know, the Mao's behavior in 1949 when there were kind of U.S. efforts to try to um, too late reach then. out. Um, r r right. I mean, at, th yeah. at, th at that point, it had already... Um, and prior to the Marshall, right. mi during the war, again, prior to the Marshall mission, we made promises to the Chinese Communist Party to deliver materiel, to deliver war, right. you know, to rip up weapons, to do all these things, which may have changed the way they right. thought about And, re and really United kind of States. extraordinary. I mean, you, you studied this in more detail than I have, but the kind of extent of those conversations yeah. is really kind of yeah. incredible. So. By the way, you asked me who else I knew from the book. Of course, I spent, I had the opportunity before he died to spend a lot of time with John Carter Vincent so, okay. and wrote a paper on John Carter Vincent, who was one of the foreign service officers who lived in, both was in Yan'an and in, right. in, in uh, Chongqing. Um, and is back in Washington at this point, leading the yes, who, China section of the State Department. Right, who ultimately was purged by McCarthy as somebody yeah. who was supposedly responsible for, quote, losing China. But we had long discussions as to mm -hmm. what the opportunities were during, during the war, not during Marshall. Right, I think right, ultimately right. he thought Marshall did everything he could, mm -hmm. but in fact it was doomed to fail, but felt that the United States missed all these opportunities. And he had discussions himself with Mao and and Zhou Enlai and the, the rest of the Chinese leadership in Yan'an and felt that they actually did have a, a kind of pro-American bent mm -hmm. and that, that it could have turned out. Uh, what he was in, so he left China in 45. He, he was driven out by, uh, in the Hurley, but the Hurley, Hurley purge. Him, yeah. Right, and he, had, he, he was writing back channel messages um, which weren't very, which were quite accurate on Hurley but not very complimentary. Right, right, right. I mean, this was, it was somebody who basically you know, sometimes in diplomacy, it, it's unusual, I think, where you put the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. And it really has an effect in, in, in the view of John Carter Vincent that that was the case. Yeah. And we might have had a different result had we played it. And Roosevelt's death actually played a role yeah, also, right, that yeah. Roosevelt had more of an understanding. And, act, and if I'm recalling, had a letter to Mao which Mao had a letter to um, Roosevelt. to Roosevelt, which never got past about Hur visiting Hurley. I Hurley, I believe, was in in China when that right. happened. Right. Yeah. Right. Which Barbara was. Tuckman wrote a piece for, if I can flog foreign affairs for a second, wrote a, for a great foreign affairs piece in when she when with the, about this letter in the seven like 1974 or something. Yes. Yes. Um, which is called I think it was called if Mao had come to Washington or something like that. It's, and it's kind of a very interesting uh, counterfactual piece. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then and then Stillwell's the other. Right. Kind of amazing character from the war who was a marshal. You know, Marshall had this incredible number of, of kind of proteges, or not exactly proteges, but kind of characters that he had discovered. And, and, and he really, early in the war especially, kind of there was this kind of older class of, um, of, of peacetime American officers. And he mm -hmm. kind of plucked out all of these characters like yeah. Stilwell and Eisenhower and Patton and kind of made them the, the leading figures in World War II. They were, and Stilwell is one of these guys who's just in a kind of amazing character in his own right and totally different in temperament than Marshall, but um, uh, has a kind of fascinating interaction and dies at a, at a kind of key moment in, right. in, in the mission. And um, you kind of see, uh, you know, all sides kind of think about Stillwell a lot. He's kind of the, this ghost in the story in some ways. Yeah. The other person, I, I spent a lot of time with John Carter Vincent. The other was uh, John Stewart Service, who I got to meet. But he lived, John Stewart Service lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so literally could walk over oh, to his okay. thing, whereas Service lived uh, in the West Coast. In Berkeley, right? Yeah, in Berkeley. And what about Melby? Did you know John Melby? No. Okay. No. So the, all, the, all these but guys it was amazing that as a kid who's writing about this had the opportunity to actually yeah. talk to the people who lived it, which was yeah. just wonderful. Really um, and it, it was the was the four Johns who were all purged by McCarthy. Yeah. Let's talk about what it means for today. Actually, you know, it's interesting as I think about. Obviously, uh, it, it's not nearly as intense, but a piece in Foreign Affairs after you became mm -hmm. editor right. was about how we've got China wrong, and all the experts had it wrong. Um, right. And it's kind of who made the decision that China would be like us. We had a policy which was determined didn't work. Is that yeah. kind of, is that, is there some analogy to that today? Yes, yeah, yeah, so I mean, again, I started You this authorized book in, that uh, article, you commissioned right, that right. article. Um, the former colleague, colleagues. That's right, so this is a piece. Um, so the, Kurt is the director of the committee. Um, Kurt, yeah, so Kurt Campbell, who was Assistant Secretary of State from 
people in this room know who Kurt Campbell was. Um, and Eli Ratner, who was a younger um, uh, official in the last administration, uh, political scientist, China specialist, um, wrote a piece called The China Reckoning. They would not say how we got China wrong. I think that's the, you know, that, that's how we um, tarted it up on a magazine cover, but uh, they would not use exactly that language. But it's about the kind of um, assumptions that U.S. policymakers, especially, and they include themselves. As, I mean, Kurt has been yeah. in this game for a long time, so he's not um, casting aspersions only on others, about some of the assumptions that, the, that U.S. policymakers made about how China would develop economically and politically and how its external behavior would change that they think have, um, have not been borne out by, by the reality. So they try to take a kind of critical look at the assumptions of policymakers um, <coughs> going back to the, the opening, essentially. Um, and, and, you know, again, I started this book in, I started thinking about this book in 2010 when that was uh, not exactly where right. U.S. policy was. Um, but it, it has, as, as you point out, kind of, there is this kind of convergence between this story and where we are in the kind of um, debate about U.S.-China policy here. You know, it's a, I think the, the Kurt and Eli piece is representative of a kind of collective dismay in, in certain circles about um, the failure, as they see it, of China to develop as we expected it to. And that is not a, um, you know, that pattern in some ways goes back to uh, the, the Marshall mission even before. You, right. you see Marshall living this, this cycle where he goes and projects American hopes and desires and expectations onto uh, Chinese dynamics and conflicts and figures. Um, you know, he's not the only one. People did it with Mao. People did it with the nationalists. Missionaries would go and see, you know, um, Sung Mei Ling and uh, uh, Madame Zhang Geshek and, and Zhang and say, you know, these are, these are just good Christians like us. And, you know, capitalists would go and see TV Sung and say, you know, this is like a banker in New York. We, we can get along with these people. And um, people like, you know, Edgar Snow would go to, or, right. or kind of um, various um, American left-wing figures would go to Yunnan and say, okay, these are just, sorry, these aren't communists. These are just kind of nice agrarian Democrats. And you see a kind of a degree of wishful thinking in all, all of those characters, but including in, in Marshall in this period. And, and the cycle is, you know, the kind of wishful, the projection of hopes, this period where um, that wishful thinking uh, seems to be undercut by realities in certain ways, and then this terrible recrimination and kind of fear of uh, charges of betrayal and, and, um, and naivete that comes later. And, you know, we're in, we're in some ways in the third part of that cycle. It's not quite as intense at this point as it was in the 1950s with McCarthyism, but um, in the kind of trade war tumult, you see a version right. of this debate and a version you know, it, it, there's a kind of overcorrection where, you know, y even if you believe that uh, there were certain assumptions made about China by their, you know, early in Marshall's mission or early in the opening um, in, in the 70s, uh, overcorrecting with, um, right. you know, t too uh, hard line a reaction later can be equally damaging. And so I, I think there are real parallels and real kind of echoes here. We, may, we also may be in a period of intensification, that it's not yeah. the end of yeah. this, that we yeah, may actually true. see, true. you know, right. we're, we see appointments being, up, you know, being kind of not confirmed because people are viewed as being uh, too tied in mm -hmm. with the old policies on right. China, right. which is somewhat similar to what happened right. after the, you know, in the 50s. People and associated yeah. with Marshall, people associated, you know, with the, Car the John Carter, Vincent, John Stewart Service Group, who kind of... Well, you, I mean, you probably know, know this quote, but it's kind of, uh, uh, as you project forward in American foreign policy now, it's kind of terrifying. Um, Avril Harriman becomes Assistant Secretary for East Asia in 1961, right, at the beginning of the Kennedy administration. Yeah. And he goes into the <coughs> State Department having, you know, been a government official earlier during the Truman administration, and he looks around and realizes that all of the, most of the Asia experts have been purged from the government right. by McCarthyism. And he says, this is a, this is a wasteland. You know, I looked around the bureau, and it's a wasteland at a time when uh, the, the pressures on U.S. policy are, are really, um, really escalating. So if we go into Vietnam and, uh, you know, you, you would like to have experts around, they're all, you know, off in academia or right. trying to rebuild their lives in various ways. And are you suggesting an analogy to today? I don't think we are, well, I don't think we are <laughs> there yet, but, but that's, we're but that's uh, of course. Right. I mean, it's um, no that, secret. That, that it's no the, secret we're seeing uh, a lot of unhappy folks. And that's right in the State right, Department right. and the Treasury and Defense Department and other places. Yeah. And, and, and you hope that, you know, you can have a degree of 
you could have a, a, a conversation about past mistakes without uh, getting to that point. Yeah. But we'll see, I don't know, we'll see if our politics have improved at all from the days of McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. Let me open the, the floor. Every, everybody's got a question. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Larry Bridwell, and I teach international business at Pace University. I would like to for you to address the ideological component because uh, President Xi Jinping has emphasized Marx, including funding the statue of his uh, birthplace in Germany. And uh, so I, and that ideology may have been influenced. Maybe they could have never been cooperation because the U.S. is capitalist and China is Marxist. But if you could address this in the context of the WTO now, in that um, the criticism being made of China that it's state planning, state directed, with subsidies, and the WTO has rules against uh, that because it hurts companies that don't get support from the government. So how, what is your forecast how the ideology of Marxism is going to affect the future of it? And I just want to make one comment. That article about Marx and the current issue of foreign affairs <laughs> I is said brilliant. I didn't really <laughs> thought I'd see the CFR do that. Um, th thank you. I'm glad to hear that. This is a piece. Um, the, let me, sorry, if I could just blog foreign affairs. For of one course. Second. Second. Um, <laughs> we said that, we wouldn't, but yeah. Okay. yeah. So we, we, I, we had what I think is a really cool set of pieces in the, the, the new issue where we, we kind of said, look, this is a really kind of, for, for, certainly for Americans, um, and I think for observers globally, a moment where people are really having a hard time um, figuring out what framework to use in evaluating the world today. We know what theory, what worldview, what lens um, really explains what's going on. And so we asked six um, thinkers who come from slightly different schools or come at the question of, of international relations from different perspectives um, to make the case that their lens is the one that best explains what is happening globally right now. And there's a um, you know, a traditional realist, there's a liberal internationalist, there's a, um, uh, Amy Chua writes about kind of tribalism and how tribalism is driving, driving global affairs. Um, someone writes about uh, uh, climate change and environmental factors, someone writes about technology. And then we said, well, you know, there's a, there's a case to be made that, you know, wh whether or not you endorse a uh, Marxist economic policy, that Marxism as a social scientist, a Marxist social scientist really had powerful insights that are that are looking better today than they might have you know 20 years ago so we got this um, uh, guy Robin Varghese to to make that case but at any rate um, the the ideological component so so to go, go back to Marshall for a second um, you know he fell somewhere in between he, he thought that some of the Johns that you were talking about were um, in, he thought that both sides were engaged in wishful thinking as he came out of China. he thought that some of the Johns who had spent time around Mao during the war um, were uh, a little bit too credulous when they heard Mao say, look, I just want to imitate American capitalism. They'd say, got it, great. Just an agrarian um, reformer that's was, right. his, was his favorite. Um, and, and, uh, and then there were people on the, on the other side, the kind of champions of, you would say, oh, he's like this, this, great, this great capitalist, and if we just um, you know, support capitalism, then the outcome will be, will be uh, uh, foreordained and, and, and straightforward. And Marshall looked at both sides and said, um, you know, I think, the, I think the ideology of the CCP is real. Um, he had conversations with Joe and Mai where they, they would kind of talk about Joe's views. And, um, you know, Mar Marshall lived in China for three years in the 1920s and had a kind of sense of the backstory. Um, and uh, he said, I think the ideology is real, but I, that does not mean I think that we cannot, you know, uh, you can never strike a deal with a communist because they'll kind of stab you in the back in the end. He had a kind of um, more subtle view of it, and he thought that it was something that needed to be taken into account in a, in a real way, but that didn't mean that um, everything was kind of uh, uh, predetermined by those ideological factors. Um, in terms of what that tells us about the WTO today, the, the thing that I would focus on is, um, you know, again, this question of wishful thinking, that if you go back and look at, um, the debates around uh, WTO membership uh, in uh, you know tw almost 20 years ago now, um, to the extent there were mistakes, it, it was uh, in the assumption that by the time we had to worry about uh, Chinese economic competition in a in a at a large scale, 
uh, China would change in ways that we wanted it to and we wouldn't have to kind of deal with some of the challenges of, you know, um, uh, state-owned enterprises and, and subsidies and other things. And that, you know, if, if you could go back and say, okay, you know, this is probably still on balance a good decision, but we should be a little bit more attentive to um, some of these, these aspects of the Chinese economy and Chinese industrial policy, they're not going to change as quickly as we want them to. Um, it's not impossible to find arrangements that, that would address them. And, you know, you could argue that uh, the last administration was focused on doing that without, uh, you know, without a trade war, without engaging in an outright trade war. But, um, again, I think that theme of kind of realism and wishful thinking um, runs through this debate as well. And, and you get, you know, versions of it again in the, among some of the trade warriors who say, if, if only we're tough, if only we kind of show them, then they will... Uh, fundamentally revise these aspects of, of economic policy and you know the kind of lesson you know, for Marshall and if you, when you look back at a lot of these kind of Cold War interventions is you need to kind of take domestic situations on their own terms and not assume that uh, the right imp application of American incentives or force or you know whatever it is will fundamentally change how foreign actors think about their interests and that's true of both allies and adversaries. Mm -hmm. Identify yourself and speak loudly since you don't have First of all, Roosevelt's death and how much do you think that was important. And then the question that Steve suggested that Joe and Ryan might not have been more pro American, but might have pushed. And my take on that point is he might not have been more pro American. He might have felt that he could have manipulated or pushed on this issue in terms of the relationship between his colleagues and the United States. And I've seen the letter to the extension in my talk in the archive. And as you know, this was only a few months before Roosevelt died. And almost to me, the conflict's attention. But I'm really curious because I think, for example, let me go to the other analogy. If Trump had not been elected, we see a very different country, so I still think that certain people who make the serious five countries. Yeah. Like um, so on the the um, the FDR question, I mean, to, to, it's a, it's a really tough one, right? The um, there are when you look at the it gets you into theories of history in a way that's um, uh, can be tough to untangle. I think in, in when you look back at the kind of origins of the Cold War, um, the factors on on the Soviet side, the structural factors, you know, some of them ideological, many of them not. Um, I think it's hard to imagine escaping uh, some some kind of grand conflict between the U.S. and Soviet Union, um, whether you have Roosevelt or Truman um, in, in, in office. And, you know, I think there are, uh, there are people who argue that Roosevelt could have finessed it through that period, but I think as the evidence grows, it's hard to imagine that you could have avoided the Cold War altogether. Um, and, you know, if FDR is in power and you can hold it off, does that change the, the situation in China? Maybe. Um, but again, it's hard to kind of play out all those counterfactuals in a, in a credible way. Um, Zhou Enlai, I, th I think you're right that he, um, you know, Mao valued him in this period in part because he knew how good he was at understanding the politics and playing the politics and personalities in the kind of international scene. And, you know, it's kind of this amazing moment in Chongqing during the war uh, where you have just this incredible collection of journalists and officers and spies and diplomats. Um, and they're all, you know, th th through the mission, and part of what makes it so, so interesting on a kind of personal level is that you have all these guys at parties together. Um, and they're, you know, J Joe is made, is made for that. That is, he's, he, uh, knows exactly how to talk to each one of these different groups, and he knows how to go talk to a journalist, and he knows how to talk to Marshall. Um, you know, <laughs> one detail that I just always remember is he would, whenever he wanted to flatter an American, he'd, he'd, uh, he'd say, you really understand China. Right. And that was his like, <laughs> ultimate line for, for, fla for flattering the Americans. Um, and it's still used frequently. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, 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 he, you know, and he was trying to play Marshall, and uh, you know, Marshall understood that intellectually, but there were still moments where, or I think this is still, still the case today, where the personal relationships, um, the Americans could be, 
uh, put a lot of stock in them. And this would be true with both the nationalists and the communists. Mm -hmm. um, but, but Joe would kind of shift, uh, you know, use the relationship to his advantage at various points. And there are times when you see, you know, all of this will become clear someday when the CCP archives are fully open, if they ever are. But, um, <laughs> uh, you know, you do see Joe at various points making the, the case for cooperation. There are other points where he is, you know, just as hardline as, as Mao is. And so, um, you know, as, as, as ever, he's such a kind of uh, complicated character that it's, it's tough to know exactly how he would have played <laughs> things if, um, if given the opportunity. It was also very interesting, you know, Mao had this habit of stepping out of events when he didn't quite know what was gonna happen or he felt like he was uh, um, kind of on his back foot. So for the first few months of this mission, Mao is, seems to be sick. It's kind of not totally clear whether he was actually sick, but is really kind of leaving things to others um, to figure out until things clear up a bit more. Think that's similar to the current president of China who disappeared for what, how many days? Yeah. 12, 14, 15? That's an interesting question. You know, prior to the uh, right in 2012, as you as you let things play out and yes, yeah, let them play out. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hi, my name is Robin Lee, Charlie Chan's worker. Um, this is following from the FDR question. Uh, FDR in his Atlantic Charter did have an anti-colonial perspective. Mm -hmm. it was directed towards the British. Yeah. And you know, I think I think third world uh, leaders saw that as a possibility, opening up as, a, as an alternative. Right. Development scheme for the United States and the United States. And the OAS at the, you know the, uh, the predecessor of the CIA. Had, o OSS, had, yeah. OSS, yeah. OSS. Had the uh, agents in Vietnam go chief in. And um, of course in China, I guess, too, right? Yeah. So uh, was there changes made once FDR passes away? Because there were, there were fundamental policy changes, you know, besides uh, you know, the, the speech in, in Missouri by. Uh, Churchill, for example, the division of Korea. Do you think if FDR would have agreed to a division of Korea? I mean, that's something that's incredible. You think about it. Yeah, so, um, it, it seems like an alteration of policy. Is that? Do you think that was the case, or you don't think? So, think so I, I think FDR probably felt. I mean, he was so committed to the anti-colonial um, elements of, of of U.S. policy in that period, and you know, had huge fights with um, Churchill over over British. Um, uh, kind of imperial concessions in, in China. And you know, the one thing that Churchill refused to give up was, was Hong Kong. He said, I'll, you know, I'll give that up over my dead body. But there are um, uh, lots of instances of FDR really kind of standing up for a strong sovereign China um, as, and, and, and many other you know, uh, former colonial or, or um, uh, powers that had been under kind of imperial um, uh, control in one way or another. Um, as, as the Cold War starts, so that is still kind of part of American rhetoric and, you know, the United Nations has been formed. China is one of the, um, the, f the first signatory of the United Nations. And um, you see that kind of anti-colonial elements of American policy start to come into conflict with the anti-Soviet elements of, of, of American policy. And over time, the anti-colonial elements kind of like fa fall away as the anti-Soviet pressures become greater. And you see, I mean, Mar Marshall at various points says, I think we need to do more to recognize that the kind of one of the fundamental factors in this period is nationalism. And, you know, he, he still uses language of his time. So he'll say, you know, the, the backward and colonial people are, are rising up and realizing that they have a role in shaping world events. Um, and so, you know, there's, there's a really interesting debate over, over these years. Well, we, we care about sustaining the French government, and that means we have to support them in Vietnam, but we also, uh, you know, don't want to support colonialism in Vietnam. Ultimately, the first part of that argument wins in case after case after case, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a, you know, not just not just here, but globally. If you, you know, kind of imagine a slightly different policy, and you know, a, a leader who was perhaps more invested, would that have changed the scenario fundamentally? It's hard to say, but you do see that that kind of tension growing, and eventually, the anti-colonial stuff uh, just seems to. Um, um, become less of a priority as the Cold War pressures grow. Of course, the question I always ask is, did the purge of the Asia hands in the State Department and elsewhere lead us to not understanding that what was going in, on in Vietnam was really an anti-colonial nationalist movement, not particularly right. a communist right. movement, and that the domino theory was fiction? Right. But because we didn't really understand that, we made terrible policy right. decisions. So in a lot of ways, the Marshall, you can trace from the Marshall mission 
up to the war in ex Vietnam. Ex exactly, and yeah. just and you know, I, I think the kind of Marshall, <coughs> Marshall was, um, you know, the, the the hedgehog and the fox. Do you think of kind of one grand theory of, of events, or do you kind of look at each, um, each each uh, challenge kind of case by case and try to think about the particulars? And Marshall was very foxy, so he would say you need to kind of understand. You know, there are certain cases you know you want to have a grand theory, sure, but you really need to take each situation on its own yeah. terms. And part of what when I look at Vietnam or China, I see Cold War dynamics, but you also need to understand who the players are. And um, you know, he he spends tons of time saying how do how do the train systems work? How do you know um, how do people in Manchuria get their food? How, where does the coal come from? Where does the timber come from? How does river shipping work? He's just so invested in mm -hmm. those, that kind of detail and sees you know believes you have to build an understanding of each case from the ground up. And that was impossible. You know, to your point, that was impossible to do if you didn't have experts. Right. So it goes off for 13, Speak loudly. For 13 months in uh, China. How did this alter the trajectory of, of history? Has anything you think changed kind of actually by like spending 13 months in China? So, so I think that he, um, it, it, made, it made him the Secretary of State who could drive the Marshall Plan forward. Um, he probably wouldn't have been Secretary of State had he not done this mission. He would have gone off into retirement. But uh, you know, mm -hmm. Truman sees him, watches him in China. He kind of transforms himself from this guy who's been in the army for 50 years uh, into into a kind of diplomat and strategist. And Truman then makes him Secretary of State, and he takes out of this mission um, the kinds of insights that become really, really central to the Marshall Plan. So I think that you know, again, would there have been no Marshall Plan? There probably been some version of it, but. He, um, a, a lot of that for him comes from the, the, the experience in China. And then secondly, you know, again, it's, this is a tough counterfactual play out, but um, there's a, a really interesting piece by uh, Ernie May, who was a um, great diplomatic historian at, at Harvard. And, and he argues that um, because of the, the policy debate and the kind of pressure to intervene in the Chinese Civil War in kind of 48, 49, that had you not had Marshall, having come out of this experience in, mm -hmm. in China um, as Secretary of State and as one of the kind of key people around, around Truman, you could have gotten um, a really significant intervention, um, kind of creeping intervention in the Chinese Civil War. Uh, and that probably would not have been, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine given how much was happening around the world that would have been kind of Vietnam or Korea scale, but you can imagine that really becoming a, a, a major factor and, um, uh, really changing the way kind of U.S. power was was exercised in those years, and if you kind of spin out counterfactuals from there, you can go in all kinds of directions. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I really don't know about this, but did, did, his, inter did his intervention or, or um, insertion into the China Civil War did it give the nationalists time? Did, it, did the nationalists have completely destroyed what were you know, so uh, defeated yeah. by the country? Give the nationals for the communists. Uh, the, the, the nationals, nationals. they have been completely destroyed Taiwan. Oh, give them time to flee. Uh, so the, the, there was an argument that part of the McCarthyist argument was actually the, the opposite of what you say. It's that if Marshall hadn't um, st you know, stalled nationalist defensives for this for several months, then um, the, um, the nationalists would have just wiped out Mao over the course of 1946. Marshall, you know, was, was aware of that argument and he looked at the, uh, the military balance and looked at the kind of logistical problems and said, I just, I don't, I don't think that's gonna happen. I think um, your only hope is to uh, show restraint, try to negotiate, um, show the Chinese people that you are intent on peace, um, not stretch your lines and over, you know, kind of create all the logistical, he'd been a logistics guy earlier, so he would say, if you try to, you know, push, stretch your, your military lines into Manchuria, you're going to open yourself to exactly the kind of attacks that Mao um, is so is so ad ad adept at launching. So, um, you know, th they're there, but the the argument against them, and that I think probably people in Taiwan would still say this: if Marshall hadn't restra restrained the nationalists, they could have won in in '46. Um, and they, you know, Marshall would point out, "You've told me again and again you can destroy Mao and." Three months. You say this to the nationalists. You keep telling me you've got 
you know, one month left or six weeks left, and then you're going to win. And each time it turns out to be um, uh, absurdly over -optimistic, overly optimistic. Um, so that would always be his counter to that, that counterfactual. Charles. Um, thanks. Charles, I'm not Great question in terms of the narrative of who lost China, Marshall's retreat from victory, how that was overstated. First question is, how was Marshall's reaction to that? Did he publicly or privately argue against it? And two, had anyone then, or even now, challenged the premise that China was ever ours to win? So, um, you know, Marshall um, had this very kind of wry, or sort of sardonic, stoic reaction to it, where you'd say, look, if I have to, like, tell you that I'm not a traitor at this point, like, I hardly think it's worth arguing. Um, so he would not engage uh, when it came to his own defense. And um, even when Eisenhower campaigned with McCarthy and uh, people were furious about it, Truman would say, you know, Truman never forgave Eisenhower for this. He said, you know, Marshall made Eisenhower's career and then Eisenhower sells him out. But Marshall said to Eisenhower, look, po it's politics, it's a dirty business, you did what you had to do. Um, I, don't, I don't hold it against you. One, one personal note um, that you know, kind of reinforces the idea that Marshall's not quite as stoic as he pretends to be. I came across this um, really touching exchange in the papers of uh, one of Marshall's wartime aides, this guy Frank McCarthy, who became a Hollywood producer um, and had been close to Eisenhower during the war. So when uh, after Eisenhower wins and he's um, campaigned with McCarthy, um, Marshall keeps saying, I, you know, like, I don't, I don't hold it against him. I don't feel that bad. Catherine Marshall, uh, Marshall's wife, talks to Frank McCarthy, the aide, and says, you know what, I think George would really appreciate it if you could go talk to, uh, go talk to Ike and have him say something nice about, about George from the White House. I, and like, don't tell George I ever asked you this. He wouldn't want, he would be <laughs> horrified if he knew that I was saying this, but I think he would appreciate it. So there was a sense that you know she could det detect underlying hurt, even though um, uh, he would not really let on. Where he did kind of publicly defend people was when others were came under McCarthy's fire. So he um, would never stand up for himself. He would say, "I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I have the stature; I can get through it. I'm retired. This is not going to ru ruin my livelihood." But when some of his former aides started to get attacked, that's the only time he spoke out against McCarthyism and. Set, you know, there's a, a line in the, the epilogue of the book that I'm not going to get quite right, but he has a, this kind of very powerful line about, you know, if this is how democracy tries to defend itself, then we're going to end up doing more damage to, um, uh, to ourselves than anyone else could, than our enemies ever could. Um, so. We are out of time, but this book is, is available outside, and the author is going to stay for so a much. few minutes to sign it. It is a great read, a ton of fun. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Thank you.